Great to be with you all. My name's uh, Devon, and it's a, a privilege to be able to um, bring God's Word to you this morning. Um, today we're continuing our series uh, looking at the Old Testament and the story of the Old Testament. And we've been using this um, kingdom framework to be able to piece together this, the big story of the Old Testament. Um, and we've seen that it's about God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. Um, those three elements of the kingdom that we're going to keep coming back to each week. Um, last week we saw the pattern of the kingdom established, um, God's people made in His image, um, living in His good world and enjoying His perfect rule and blessing um, as they rule creation with Him. And so that's that um, picture we saw in Genesis 1. And so today we'll see what went wrong. So let's pray. Lord, give us understanding that we would keep your word, observe it with all our hearts, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Living in this world, one of the tensions we feel every day is the undeniable beauty and ugliness of our world. Why is the world so beautiful, yet so ugly at the same time? Um, When nuclear energy was first developed, it had um, the potential to provide a clean energy source for the world. Um, It's led to the development of nuclear medicine and radiation that saves countless lives. Uh, But tragically, this amazing technology can also be used to create weapons of mass destruction. This same technology that can eradicate a tumour was also used to drop a bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II. Um, The creation of the internet has completely transformed the way we communicate, how we access information and connect with others. Um, We're now able to share ideas and collaborate and even build communities that were previously impossible. But this same advancement has also facilitated the rise of online bullying. Um, pornography, um, an illegal trade that's destroyed many lives. Um, Even think about our global economy. Um, Our economy has facilitated international trade and growth. It's it's created jobs. It's lifted millions out of poverty. And yet it's also widened the gap between the rich and the poor. It's led to the exploitation of natural resources and has been used as a means of oppression over the vulnerable. In these three examples, we can clearly see the triumph of human greatness, but also the tragedy of human evil. Um, As a society, we're often asking the question, is the world getting better or is it getting worse? And honestly, it's really hard to tell. Because on the one hand, global health is increasing, the world's getting more environmentally conscious, more educated, poverty is decreasing. But we know there's still a war going on in the Ukraine. Um, The number of people living under oppressive governments around the world is rising. And like many of us have experienced, uh, mental health conditions and substance disorders has increased significantly over the last decade. So we're constantly feeling this tension of living in an amazing world, but also a world that we know is so cruel and broken. So what accounts for this tension that we all feel and experience every day? Well, Genesis 3 wrestles with this tension and reveals why the world is the way it is. And so first it reveals the origin of our problem, the origin of our problem. Um, Back in chapter 2, we saw a generous God who provides everything that we need for life. He he places Adam in a garden. Um, He gives plants and trees for food. We see streams of water that come up from the earth to give sustenance. Uh, There's relationship. uh, God gives Adam a companion, Eve, to love and partner together in the task God has for them. Uh, It's a place with no shame. They've got nothing to hide. 
And so they walk with God freely and intimately. And God shows them the way to live. He, he gives them one rule for how to enjoy the garden. They're free to eat from any tree except one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if they eat of it, they would surely die. And so this would act as an expression of simple trust and obedience in the midst of a world that's so abundant and so plentiful. We see how God's Word guides them and how God's Word provides for them. But now in in chapter 3, everything is about to change. Um, A serpent comes to Eve and asks her, did God actually say that you should not eat of any tree in the garden? Um, In Revelation, this serpent is, is revealed to be Satan himself, the one who deceives and leads humanity astray. But I want you to look at how things go wrong. The serpent first gets Eve to doubt God's word. Did God really say that? And notice the deception. Remember, God said, eat of everything but one tree. But notice what the serpent does. He asks, did God say you shall not eat of any tree? Do you see how he doubts but also distorts God's word? You know, at this point, you're probably, you're probably screaming to Eve, don't talk to him, rebuke him, just walk away. But sadly, she engages. Oh, it's not just Satan, is it? it? We ourselves, we doubt and distort God's word. I want you to notice Eve's reply. She says to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, when did God say they weren't allowed to touch it? You see how they're adding to God's Word and they're making God out as someone who's not generous, but maybe a little bit stingy. See, our problem begins by doubting, then distorting God's Word, before finally God's Word is defied. Um, In in verse 4, the serpent says, you will not surely die. Uh, Now all the subtlety is gone. It is flat out defiance of what God said. And and, and look carefully at the reasoning in verse 5. He says, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Um, Wanting to know good and evil isn't just about knowing the difference between good and evil. It's about wanting to define good and evil for ourselves, apart from God's Word. It's a desire to be God and set our own rules. Do you see the deception? The the, the serpent says God made this rule because He's trying to withhold something good from you. He's oppressing you. Um, I wonder if you can trace this progression in your own heart when you're tempted to sin, to to doubt, distort, and then defy God's Word. Uh, Take greed, for example. Um, We know the Bible talks strongly and warns strongly against greed in all our lives. But notice we begin by doubting God's Word to us, because deep down none of us think we're greedy, right? Um, Our minds, they go to stereotypes of the overpaid CEOs or, you know, the people that think about the prosperity gospel and we say, that's who God's speaking about. And then we may distort God's word by placing ourselves as the exception to the rule. And so maybe we say, you know, if God really knew my situation, if He really knew the financial pressures I'm under, well then, He'd know that warning doesn't apply to me even though the average Australian is in the richest 1.5% in the world, we just compare to people who are richer than us, and we say, we're not rich. And instead, we say, we need more. We need more money. Before God's Word is defied, and instead, our hearts are drawn to an accumulation of wealth and possessions. And I know this because I see this in myself. Our hearts are so deceptive. 
next time you're tempted to disobey God in anything. We can't forget that all temptation seeks to destroy you. Remember, it is not a taste of something good that God's withholding from you. But sadly, we see Adam and Eve, they buy the lie and they take the fruit. And so the origin of our problem is that our hearts are deceived. But it's not just that. In verse 6, the fundamental problem is that our hearts want something else. Um, Eve saw the tree as a delight to the eyes, as something to be desired to make one wise. It's the language of lust and desire. Um, St. Augustine, he describes sin as a disordered love. Um, And here Adam and Eve's their desire for wisdom to be God becomes more important than their desire for faithfulness and for obedience to God. Isn't that true of all sin, that it's about disordered love? For example, when we lie, we, in that moment, our love for our reputation overrides our love for the truth. Or when we gossip, our love for our importance and our popularity overrides our love to protect others and their privacy. Or maybe when we lust, our love for pleasure overrides our love for purity. Isn't it so true what the reformer Thomas Cramner says? He says, what the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. And that's exactly what we see here. The origin of our problems lies in the human heart. Our problem is a disordered love that doubts, distorts, and defies God's Word. Um, If God is the one who spoke creation into existence and it's His Word that's ingrained into the fabric of our universe, then our decision to defy it must have devastating consequences. Because I I wonder if you've noticed what's happened in all this. In all of this, God's created order has been overturned. Where humans were given a commission to rule over creation, what's happened? What's happened? By listening to the serpent, a created being, humanity has allowed creation to rule over them. They have obeyed the voice of creation over the voice of God. That's what Romans 1 says. Romans 1 says, we've exchanged a worship for the created God for created beings. Paul says we've become enslaved because we're worshipping things that were never meant to carry that burden. That's what we see today. Um, Back then, people worshipped idols made out of stone and wood. Um, Today, people worship idols made out of glass, metal, plastic, um, like this. Uh, But it's the same, isn't it? It's an exchange of worship away from the Creator to the created. And so think about our phones. I mean, Why are we always checking for updates? Why am I always refreshing my phone and seeing what's on social media? Well, part of me kind of wants to know everything. I want to be omniscient, like God. Part of me wants to control everything. I want to be omnipotent. And when we're seeking to be constantly connected to everyone all the time, part of me wants to be everywhere, to be omnipresent. And you see, when we want everything, everywhere, all at once, when we try and take God's place, it's no surprise there's devastating consequences, right? I want you to see, as soon as they reach for the fruit, what happens in verse 7? They become immediately aware of their nakedness. Um, Back in chapter 2, men and women were naked and not ashamed. They had nothing to hide. But now they are acutely aware of their guilt and their shame, and they try and cover it up. And sadly, it results in, here, a broken relationship with God. Uh, You'll see in verse 8, where humanity used to walk with God in the garden, now they hide from His presence. Sin separates them. Um, In verse 9, even as God seeks them out, you'll see their relationship has fundamentally changed. 
Um, you see that today in kids. Um, when they've done something wrong, often they will run and hide, right? They know they're in trouble and they can feel very acutely a sense of shame. The consequence of, sh- of sin is shame and it breaks relationships. It pushes us away. Um, I wonder if you've ever told someone close to you what you love about them. All the things you reckon they're great at, all the things you appreciate about them. And I wonder if you say that to them, I wonder what their reaction was. Um, Often it can get really awkward when we do that. Um, I, I know when I do that for people, they visibly recoil. They can't handle it. They can't look me in the eye. Why do you think that is? It's, it's because we've been so impacted by shame that we don't know how to accept a compliment from others. Sin doesn't just break our relationship with God. No, it breaks relationships with each other. And in verse 12, when God asks Adam what went wrong, notice what he says. The woman. She's the problem. The woman you gave me. She gave me the fruit and I ate. Remember, just a chapter before, Adam was singing a love song to this same woman. He was serenading her bride, saying, man, at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, we belong together. Didn't last too long. No, no, in Adam's eyes, his precious wife is now really the source of his problems, right? And, And where God designed relationships to bring life and joy, now we see relationships are filled with conflict, aren't they? even the best ones. Instead of serving others, now, now we, we sadly hurt others. Instead of our hearts loving and being drawn towards others, now our hearts have turned inwards in ourselves. We can only think about what's best for us. Oh, and in case you didn't notice, Adam, he blames God too. You gave her to me. Uh, even as God turns to Eve, She blames someone else too. She says, no, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Do you see this kind of culture of victimhood? Everyone is is pointing the finger at someone else. Isn't it interesting when we ask the question of what's wrong with the world, we never start with us. Uh, We blame the government all the time. We, We blame the media. Sometimes we blame God. We say, You know, there's evil in the world, so God must not be good. He must be evil. Or maybe we say God's abandoned us. He doesn't care. But we've seen the problem of evil, the origin of the problem lies in the human heart, that we defy God's word, that we suppress His voice. And then as soon as things go wrong, we blame Him. We accuse Him of abandoning us. Do you see this twisted cycle of blame that we've created? No, Genesis reveals a world so broken because we're experiencing the consequences of our decision to break relationship with our Creator. But if, we, if we're really going to grapple with the beauty and ugliness of our world, we need to hear from God. Because that's what we've seen. His Word brings clarity. It sheds light. And so now we're going to see His verdict on our situation what God will say. And He'll say that where there was blessing, now there is curse. Um, As God turns to Adam and Eve, notice that their curse is directly tied to their blessing. And so in verse 16, where God blessed humanity, He commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. Um, Now notice that the woman's multiplication in childbearing is incredibly painful. Isn't that true of the childbearing experience? Birth is simultaneously one of the greatest miracles you'll ever witness, but it will also be one of the painful moments of your life. It speaks to the the triumph and tragedy of our world seen here in the same act of childbearing. Um, Even our Our blessing to flourish and multiply has been fractured and the curse here affects relationships between men and women too. Um, Where God blessed us with relationships as a gift, God says to Eve, her desire shall be contrary to Adam, but he shall rule over you. 
And so where men and women were created as companions, now they are competitors. Where relationships between male and female were supposed to display the beauty and difference of being made in God's image, now there's going to be a struggle for power, for dominance and and control, which we've seen very sadly play out over history. And verse 17, where um, we were previously blessed and called to work the ground, now the ground is cursed. We feel this every day, that often as great and as fulfilling as work can be, because of God's verdict, it will always carry now a sense of futility and frustration. I wonder how how many of you here would describe your work as sometimes being futile or sometimes being frustrating. I'd probably say even the best job, right? We can see the goodness in work, but man, it can be so frustrating. Mondays always roll around too soon. Holidays never last long enough. Um, I recently heard from an auditor in our congregation that the word auditor, A-U-D-I-T-O-R, really stands for, all you do is think of resigning. (laughs) And I was even speaking to an auditor, Cindy, here today. And that may be true of audit. Hopefully I haven't offended you guys. But it's kind of true of everything, right? In work, we're constantly experiencing its futility, and we're always imagining the grass is greener on the other side. But then you find you quit your job, you find another one, and you know what? (laughs) It's it's just as frustrating, just in a different way. Uh, But sadly here, God's verdict ultimately ends in death. Remember, God warned humanity if they rejected His rule, instead they ate from the the uh, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. And that's what happens. Um, Because in verse 19... God says, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Death is the most common human experience that's going to come for everyone here. But when it comes for those we love, we find it very hard to accept because we instinctively know in death something is wrong. Deep down, we know that this is not what we were designed for. And death is constantly screaming to us, this world is not as it should be. It is living under a curse. And so as you look at our world and as you see how we have descended into conflict and and chaos, it might lead you to take a pretty fatalistic view of our world. Perhaps all the death and, and the brokenness and the frustration really indicates to you there is no meaning or purpose to our lives. But the fact that it bothers us at all as a society should reveal something to you. The fact that we say something is wrong should reveal something about our hearts. Um, When you see an animal rolling in the mud, you don't call that a tragedy. It's just what they do, right? But if you were to see a human rolling in the mud, brought down to the dust, you would say, that is wrong. That's a tragedy. And so why the difference? It's because we were created for so much more. We were created for a greater glory. What makes Genesis 3 so ugly here is the beautiful vision of Genesis 1. That we were created for something better and greater than this. We were created to be God's people living in His perfect world under His rule and blessing. And so what makes our world so ugly is that we were created for such beauty. So this is where we are, where where God has created a blessed people to live with His presence under His rule and blessing. It's all been lost now. Instead, we've seen today, humans have rejected God's rule We've defied His Word, our hearts have turned from Him. And now where humanity used to experience blessing in life, now we're going to experience curse and death. And sadly, verse 24, Adam and Eve are removed from God's place in the garden. They are cast away from His presence. 
So the pattern of the kingdom that was established last week now has been lost. It's all a bit depressing, isn't it? But even here, I wonder if you notice that there are some glimpses of hope. As God curses the serpent, you'll see verse 15, he says, He'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. As God curses the serpent, he foreshadows a conflict between serpent and humanity. But that through the offspring of this woman, we will prevail. It foreshadows a human being who's going to come to deliver a death blow to the serpent on its head, but also being injured in the process. And so now we anticipate God is coming. He's bringing someone to win a victory over Satan but someone who will receive a blow himself. Um, This verse is understood as the first glimpse of the gospel we get in the Old Testament because it predicts that God is providing someone who will win a victory on our behalf, but at great cost to himself. And we read later in Romans 16, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet and we know this promise still stands. And then if you look at verse 21, where humans have tried to cover their shame with fig leaves, no, we see it's God himself who covers their shame. Even in their sin, God is still providing for them. But but I want you to realize their covering is made from animal skins. Genesis says an animal had to die. Someone had to give their life so that we could cover your shame. This passage anticipates that God will not leave us in sin and death, but that by His grace, He will work to redeem us so that one day we'll find our way back to the garden. And so as we wrestle with the beauty and ugliness of our world, um, the French mathematician Blaise Pascal, he says pretty bluntly, humans are the glory and the garbage of the universe. He says, to properly navigate this complex world we live in, we need a worldview that can account for the greatness of humanity as well as its inherent evil. And that's what the opening chapters of Genesis do. They, they help us make sense of this tension. So as we close today, um, I want to look at how can we live with this tension as we feel the brokenness of this world every day. First thing, we need to lament. Um, So much of the Old Testament is lament. There's a book called Lamentations. We need to lament because lament is expressing your sorrow and your grief to God in a fallen world. Um, As Christians, we don't need to live with a false sense of optimism. We don't need to just ignore or suppress our pain and pretend it doesn't exist. Instead, lamenting, it orients us to the reality of our world and its brokenness. It gives us an avenue to really express our grief and our disappointment. Lamenting allows us to just sit with people and just cry with them. And so here God invites us, come to me. Come with your anger and your tears and find your rest in me through Him who suffered for us and who suffers with us. Second thing is to repent. Um, We've seen today we need to own our part in the brokenness of our world. Repentance recognizes the root problem of uh, of our world lies in the human heart. It reminds us we cannot solve our own problems. It acknowledges God needs to step in and He needs to do something about it. We need Jesus. And as you'll find, as we confess our sins to God, it reminds us of God's grace and and His his forgiveness that we've received. Not through the death of an animal, but through the death of His own Son, Jesus, who on the cross died to cover our shame. And finally, we need to look ahead. Just as this passage anticipates, God isn't done with the world. This is not the way it'll end, but we know that he stepped 
into human history to rescue us. In this way, Christianity isn't just realistic, it's hopeful. And so God promises there will be a day where Satan, sin and death are defeated. And so now we constantly feel the weight of our sin. We, we experience the frailty of our bodies, even the finality of death, but we know this is not how it'll end. We need to lift our eyes. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to start to see the beginning of God's plan of redemption, where He's going to begin to restore everything here that's lost. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge our hearts have strayed so far from You. Lord, we're so sorry that we love other things instead of You and Your glory. We're sorry that our actions have undermined Your Word that brings life. Lord, as we grieve our broken world, we thank You that we have forgiveness and acceptance through the cost of Your Son, Jesus. So Lord, help our tears now to be filled with hope as we look forward to a better future. In Jesus' name, amen.